let's get started. So physicists have given themselves the audacious and ambitious task of understanding the whole universe. That's what this whole building is about, is we're trying to understand the whole universe. Uh, that's a pretty crazy idea, but that's the task, that's the, that's the road we're on, and we're making some progress. And in this class, our goal is to do the same thing. By the time you walk out of here in May, I'm hoping we can have gotten as close as possible to that goal, understanding how everything works. That's the name of the class. It's only a semester. We might have to skip a couple parts of the universe, but uh, that's our goal. We'd like, I'd, I would love for everyone from May 12th on, the rest of your life, to walk around and go, yep, I know how blue skies work, I know how rainbows work, I know how cars work, I know how laptops work, cell phones, uh, whatever. That's a pretty good goal. Now, where we're going to start and where we've already started is we've started with Newton. And the reason we started with Newton is because he gives us, in 1686, he gives us some axioms or laws of motion. And that's not the whole universe, but the moving parts of the universe. That's a pretty good chunk. So that's not a bad place to start. So with Newton's laws, we can get a good understanding of footballs and baseballs and lacrosse balls and basketballs and soccer balls. We can get a good understanding of cars and trains and planes and planets and galaxies and stars. So it's a good chunk. It's a good chunk. So that's where we are right now. Um, we're starting with what are usually called his first three laws. We might get to a fourth. Uh, the first one, stuff is hard to shake. An object at rest tends to stay that way. An object in motion tends to stay that way. At the end of last class, Someone asked me a really good question. What keeps something moving once it's going? That's actually an excellent question because, as I said before, that's not our typical experience. I've never gotten something going and just watched it go forever. I can throw a football, oh, I don't know, 20 yards. I don't know how far I can throw a football. Probably hit the wall, maybe. So I can throw a football. It's going to stop. I can kick a soccer ball, maybe half field. I can throw a basketball, maybe half court. It's going to stop. I can shove something across the floor, it's going to eventually stop. I even have these cool, they're not up here today, I have those cool little air hockey pucks. I can get one of those going, it eventually stops. So it's not typical to see that. But Newton, having never seen or met an astronaut, thought, okay, let's picture this. Let's, let's remove ourselves from some of the things that tend to get in the way, like the ground, air. Let's imagine ourselves floating in space, and I take my baseball, and I just go, and it, the moment it leaves my hand, it is just going off forever to infinity. That's a little bit crazy. And so, so what somebody asked me last class, it's a very good question. What is keeping it going? I'm not touching it anymore. So as soon as I've let it go, it's going to go on forever. And that seems like it needs a motor, it needs a little rocket pack or something to just keep going forever. And so it's a little bit counterintuitive, but I want us to buy this because it turns out <coughs> 2016, we're still trying to nail down the details, but it seems to be true that once you've given it motion, that is now its state. That is now its nature. It, you have changed its nature, and today we're going to talk more about how you did that, but you've changed its nature. You've given it a new way of being, and that way of being is motion, and now it's in motion, and it will stay that way until acted upon again by somebody else, and that's, I don't know, kind of empowering. You can just off you go, and you've, you've You've affected infinity by doing that. All time and space, you've affected by giving something a good nudge. So that's kind of cool that you can do that, but it's also a little bit counterintuitive. So I want to make sure that's sunk in, that once, you, once you're not touching it anymore, given any other out, you know, take away any other outside influences, that's its now state forever. Now, in, in the normal world, I don't get to see that very often. So I'm going to take this ball, I'm going to give it some velocity, and as soon as it left my hand, it's, it's kept going up. So that's pretty cool. So I, I, I gave it some velocity upward, and it kept going up. But eventually, it slowed, it slowed, it slowed. And for an instant, I don't know if you caught it, for an instant, it was stationary right at the top. It's hard to see. It was stationary, at least linearly. It was still rotating. See if I, I don't know if I can get it to not rotate. Um, but it was stationary at the top for an instant, and then it came back down. Something called gravity was affecting that. But for, for at least a minute there, it was on its way up and kept going. So that's Newton's first law. Once I get it going, it's going to go that way forever until somebody brings it to a stop. 
Last class we talked about Newton's second law, and also I briefly mentioned Newton's third law that I like the phrase as stuff pushes back. We may have time today to get a little more into Newton's third law, but really today I want to investigate Newton's second law a little more. Let's see, Newton's second law, more stuff, harder to shake. Or as I phrased last class, a relationship. Now I'm going to try to stay away from equations, and there's an equal sign in there. All three of those have equal signs, so some people think if there's an equal sign, equal, two things are equated, that's an equation. Uh, if, there's, if there's only three letters in my equation, I like to think of those as nice, simple relationships, not equations. And uh, that's not just semantics, I really do mean I want us to see the relationships there. So, as I said last class, what that relationship, the top one is saying, more stuff, harder to shake. In other words, if M is bigger, you're going to need more F to, for the same A. And then I've rewritten it two ways. I don't think that's too crazy algebra to see how I did that. I've rewritten it two ways, where I divided both sides by M or both sides by A, to see that relationship, how that relationship kind of plays out. So what the relationship is telling us is if I want to accelerate something, if I want to accelerate something, I need to push on it. If I want to A something, I need to F on that something. It's not a good way to put it. If I, want, if, I want to, if I want to accelerate something, I need to push on it. That's the F, push or pull or force, right? <laughs> That's on camera. It's going to be online later. Okay. Um, anyway, so if I want to accelerate something, I need to push on it, but it's not, the equation doesn't say A equals F. The, does, the equation doesn't say A equals F. You want to accelerate something, you push on it. There's this thing on the bottom, the mass, that M is controlling how much acceleration you get for a certain push. That M, whether, if it's really large, that's going to make A small. And so that's what I want us to see in those relationships. That I can push on something, but that doesn't just tell me right there, I'm going to push on something and I'm going to get some acceleration out of it. I need to... I need to be aware of that, that my force is divided by, or sort of impeded by, how heavy the thing is. And then the second way to phrase this same relationship, which I think a lot of physicists think of mass the way I, I phrased it down in that third line. What is mass? Mass is just that impediment. Mass is, I'm going to push on something, and if I watch, depending on how much it accelerates, that sort of tells me how massive something is. In fact, that's a good way to figure out how something, how massive something is, is give it a push and watch it accelerate. If it, ex if it accelerates infinitely, it's massless. If it doesn't accelerate at all, it's got infinite mass, but we're usually going to stay away from those two extremes. But mass can often be thought of as that thing that impedes motion. You push on something, how massive it is, is sort of controlling or determining how much acceleration you're going to get. Okay. So the first two classes, uh, I sort of avoided the word acceleration because there's a lot built into that. And today I want to spend a good chunk of time making sure we're very solid about this term acceleration. So many of the words that we use in physics are also used in everyday language. Momentum, friction, mass, acceleration, and often they're used inaccurately. So my team had a lot of momentum going into the first half. That's not the same way we tend to use it in physics, or a lot of friction in that relationship. That's not the way we use it in, in physics. And sometimes mass and weight are confused, and acceleration is one of those things that, and velocity and speed, I think those are our goals for the day, maybe velocity, speed, and acceleration. Those are things that we have to be solid on. So for this class, uh, for the, especially the next few weeks, how well we understand acceleration and speed and velocity as well, uh, it's going to determine how well we can understand some other concepts. So, let's start with, actually let's back it up, let's start with just the simplest thing I can think of, let's start with just position, and so when Newton is talking about motion, when Newton is talking about motion, what he means is something that's changing its position, so maybe we should start there. And so, in physics, we're often concerned with where stuff is. We often use a Cartesian coordinate system to say that thing 
if you remember like geometry class, that coordinate is three comma two or something. We're not gonna get too much into stuff like that. But we're often concerned with something's position, often re in relation to some origin, I think is a good way to, so when I say I'm, you know, I'm five miles, I can't just say I'm five miles. I'd say I'm five miles from home, or I'm five miles from UVA or something like that. Five miles is, doesn't really define much. So it's usually from some origin or some reference point. So if I were to call, I don't know, the corner of this desk the origin of this classroom, I could actually define each one of you in terms of your x, y, and z coordinates. I could say you're one meter this way, and you're one meter this way, and then like half a meter this way, and then some of you are a few meters in the z direction calling the z up. So hopefully that's not too crazy, the idea that we can describe something's position. Oh, and here's my first eye clicker for the day. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, here's my first eye let's get our Let's get out our eye clickers. I'm going to call this one. I'm going to call this one eye clicker number one. Okay, so this question is going to get us uh, started on the rest of the conversation. Uh, let's see. So it sounds like everyone's got their eye clickers out. Here's our first eye clicker of the day. No, not that one. I, we're going to do that one next. Hold on a second. Let's do... Let's do... That one. We're going to start with that one. Yeah, let's start with that one. Yes. Pardon? Oh, good question. Um, whoops. Another good question. Uh, yeah, what's their official or, uh, yeah, solely or, what's their official? Have they officially adopted anything other than Imperial? Yeah. They, yeah, like a, a, a big guy's like five stone or something. They're, they're not, it's not their official. It's not, yes. Does this, great question. I think with the way, uh, <laughs> I think the way I made it, uh, hey class, great question. I've had a couple good questions. I'll, let's see, we've been, we've been on this one for two minutes. I'll let it keep going for a second. Get, we're getting some good answers here. Um, that's an excellent question. Is this part of our grade? Yet. Uh, I'm going to drop like six or seven or eight iClicker days. And so if you miss a couple days, whether you weren't here or your clicker wasn't working, whatever, it should be fine. Another great question, is it for accuracy or attendance? I think the way I'm going to do it is if you get it right, you get 100%. And if you get it wrong, you get like 80%. So I want you to, I want to have a little incentive for you to think about it. I don't want you to just walk in, you know, stand over there, walk in, hit A, and then go home. Um, I want to have a little incentive for you to get it right. Okay. All right. Here's the uh, here's the right answer. That's not it. Where's my right answer? Hi. Let's see. There's the right. That's the right answer. Three. So uh, if you said fewer than five, you were right. That's the right answer. Um,
So, uh, four, four. U.S. I don't know. Do people recognize what those are? U.S. Liberia, Myanmar, and Alaska. Four, right? Four countries. So yeah. Um, here's the thing: the entire scientific community and just about everyone, the gray countries, has figured out something, and that is there's this genius system. And I don't know if you are aware of how genius it is. They've related like all of the things anyone would ever care about into this thing that's divisible by the same number of fingers most people have. And so most humans have 10 fingers, so therefore we are on a decimal system. We count by tens, and if you have 10 tens, you have 100. If you have 10 of those, you have 1,000. And so we've taken a, like a human scaled thing called a meter. It's like this big. It's like the size of, I don't know, someone's arm or a really short person or a toddler, something. We've taken like, it's a human scale, so it's not like a nanometer. You know, it's not like, it's human scale. Divide that up. We've got these things called centimeters. Centi, there's 100 of them. And if you have a cubic centimeter, that's the same volume as a milliliter. And so when you buy your Camelback drink, it's labeled uh, in milliliters on there. There's a thousand liters, milli meaning a thousand. There's a thousand milliliters. Each one of those milliliters has the same volume as a cubic centimeter. And if that volume is water, it weighs one gram. And the amount of energy to cool that water one degree is one joule of energy. And so all the units are related. It's brilliant. And so I can use, so everything just kind of works out really well. So if I want to cool one milliliter of water, that's, I know that that would be a 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. And I would need 1,000 joules of energy to do that, to lower it one degree. Uh, it's just great. And then. Um, there's us and Liberia and Myanmar, I'm not sure why. Um, I could measure my height in Gunter's chains or furlongs or barley corns or poppy seeds. It's, and there's like 12 lines to an inch and then four poppy seeds to a barley corn. I mean, as if, if I was an agricultural society, that makes sense, right? Like if I wanted to tell someone how tall my horse is and they don't know what a meter is, I could say, well, you know, like, imagine 700 barley corns on end to end. And they'd go, okay, that makes sense. But most of us nowadays don't have access to barley corns. Yeah, with the microbrew revolution, maybe more people are familiar with what that looks like. But it's not, it's not a really good, great system. And barley corns are in different sizes. People's hands are different sizes. Anyway, so I, it's a shame that we're, we're um, still stuck there. But, sorry, um, soapbox over. We're going to talk about position. Usually, I'm going to try to use meters. Um, and one of the reasons I want to do that, I would love it. I mean, I'm assuming someone in here did not grow up in the United States or Myanmar or Liberia and knows outside right now. could tell you. It's like, let me see if I can do this. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. It's like 20-some degrees outside Celsius. Anyone who grew up? Am I close? No. It's less than 20? OK. It's like 10 outside right now? OK, see? I just remember, I know if it's 33, that's hot, right? I, I think you want to stop riding your bike around 33, 35, I think. That's about all I know. One zero freezes water. So I would love it if more Americans had like a better sense of that. I would love it if people, if I said, you know, that guy's three meters tall, if people, if people knew if that was tall or not. Or, um, yeah. that. My, you know, that guy weighs 50 kilograms. Is that a big guy or a little guy? Most people um, don't have a real sense of that. So we're going to try. That's one of my goals in this class. Get, use, you, we're going to use metric, and people will start to get a sense of that. Anyway, soapbox over. This is a meter. We're going to talk, starting in this class, we're going to talk about things in their position, and we're going to label that in meters. So as I was saying, I might be able to label each one of you. If this is the origin of the classroom right here, I might be able to say, you're one meter, you're one comma one, you're one comma one comma one. I'm negative one, I might be negative one comma one, you know, you, you remember geometry class. So meters is how we measure position. Now in physics, that's nice to know, but here's where it gets, Im here's the important uh, measurement I think for us, is we don't live in a static universe, most stuff doesn't just sit around. We're in a dynamic universe where stuff is moving. 
And Newton, of all the other things he did, he also invented this thing called calculus. And the main reason he did that is he needed math to describe things that change. That's why Newton, Newton was sitting at, at the, looking at the math in front of him, and it was not appropriate for things that were changing, for changing quantities. So when I say, well, you know, the area rectangle is base times height, that's only true if the base is constant and the height is constant. If things are moving around, uh, that I, I need a better math. And so he invented this thing called calculus. We're not going to do any calculus. But the reason it's important for us is we are going to deal with changing quantities. And so right now, let's, I don't know, let's call this spot I'm standing on zero. I'm at, let's, let's just consider one axis. We don't even deal with x and y right now. We'll just say x, that left, right. We'll just do one axis. So right now I'm at the origin. I'm at zero. And right now I'm at one. My position changed. So physics needs to be able to deal with the fact that quantities change, and then here's probably the most important part, the rate at which they are doing that. So physics cares not only about change, but the rate at some, that something's changing. So if I was at zero, and then I'm later at one, whether I did that in an hour or in a millisecond, that's a pretty big difference. And so we're concerned not just about position, but the rate. We're not just concerned about position, we're not just concerned about the change of position, we're concerned about the rate of change of position. So that's a term that should really sink in. I want everyone to understand the, the term rate of change of position. And I think we do all understand that if you've ever driven a car and there's been a needle or a digital number in front of you, that's usually reporting miles per hour or if you're in any of the other 200 countries in the world, it's reporting kilometers per hour, but it's reporting distance per time. Per meaning, well, I like to think of per as divide by. Or, yeah, that's a good way to think of it. So, uh, when, I, when my car says I'm going 60 miles per hour, that's a rate of change. I'm going 60 miles, but that's not that, that's not that descriptive. So if my car said, Good job, you're going 60 miles. That could be in a second, which would be awesome, or that could be in three hours, which means there's bad traffic on the way to DC or something. So 60 miles per hour, it's, how it's, your, it's your change of position, 60 miles, per how quickly you're doing it. And so the other eye clicker, it's, um, if, you want, if you want to, yeah. Actually, this is a good one to actually do. We should actually do this one. The other eye clicker was, let me move it. Um, you may have saw, seen it. And the reason I, this, uh, this eye clicker came from a YouTube video I saw. So let's, oh, I have to click start. Um, okay, go ahead and vote on that one. All right, good. You guys are smart. Phew. Okay, so I don't have to explain this one. Thank you. All right. Someone has a joke with A, right? Um... So, please don't, let's see, I'll give us, I'll give us 10 more seconds. Nice work. Good job. Um, there it is. So don't do it now. Don't do it now. But do go home and at some point look up the YouTube video. Uh, there's, I actually saw there's two very similar videos where somebody's asking their friend this question, and it one of the videos is like seven minutes long of the friend trying to explain to their friend. So if you go, if you're going 80 miles per hour, how many miles do you go in an hour? And then their friend's like, I don't know. And, and then they try that. And they, it's, it's, it goes on for seven minutes. It's pretty funny. But um, I'm glad, I'm glad, it looks like most of us got that. But I don't want to totally um, belittle the person in the video that wasn't getting it. There's a lot of people that that concept is lost. Or what I think, I think what's lost is miles per hour just becomes a phrase that has lost the meaning of distance per time. 
Now, maybe if you had told the same person, if you're going 10 meters per second, how many meters do you go in a second? Maybe they would get it. Meters per second maybe is, would cause them to rethink what those, those words mean. Anyway, so if your car goes, is going 80 miles an hour, that's a, that's a description of how quickly it's changing its position. Every hour, it's changing its position 80 meters. Doesn't sound like I need to describe that. Now, good, so I can move on from that one. Now, in, in, like I said, for us, we're usually gonna use meters per second. So <clears throat> here's a meter. So if I'm change, my position right now is zero. If I wanted to get there in about a second, that's like this fast. So right now, I'm moving a constant one meter per second, and we'll call this positive. So for us, I think it's important that, yeah, let's, usually when you're describing position and velocity, you're, you're, you're gonna call something positive. Let's call it the right positive. It's arbitrary, but let's call it the right positive. So right now, I'm reducing my position. Zero's over there, and I'm at, I don't know, five, 10 something. Um, so right now I'm going 10, nine, eight, seven. I'm going negative one meter per second. So my velocity, the rate at which I'm changing my position is one meter, one meter per second, zero, negative one meter per second. By the way, um, I don't want to get too hung, I don't want to get too hung up on too much terminology, but we need to know velocity. That's what that is. It's the rate of change of position. And if, if I were to, when you leave this class in May, I am hoping that there's certain misconceptions about the world that we've maybe helped to, cle helped to clear up. Here's one of them, the difference between velocity and speed. If you're ever driving your car, you've noticed it's not a velocity meter. Those things do exist. It's a speedo meter, that thing on the front of the car. So a speedo meter is not telling you velocity, it's telling you speed. And you know it's a speedo meter because if it was a velocity meter, zero would probably be top center and then to the left would be like negative however fast your car can go backwards and then to the right would be positive. And so if your car could tell you you're going backwards or forwards, it would have a sign and that would be velocity. Speed is just velocity without any direction or sign associated with it. So I, my, as I drive around in my car at a constant 40 miles an hour, my speed O meter doesn't change. It, the needle's right on 40, but I'm changing my direction, and that actually means I'm changing my velocity. Velocity has direction associated with it, but that's usually not captured by the device in your car. That's why they call it a speedometer. Okay, now that we've cleared that up. Okay, position, rate of change of position, usually called velocity. If you don't care about direction or sign, we'll call it speed. Let's call it velocity. Good. I think we got that. Next, here's an important one, and here's, here's kind of the whole reason I wanted to make sure we got to this today, is the A part. I've used the word, but I want to make sure we spend at least a few minutes feeling good about what I mean by the A part, and that's acceleration. And acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. And so I've got my position. My position might be changing and that has a rate to it. So the rate I'm changing position right now is like one meter per second. And if I change that, I've accelerated. So acceleration is the rate of change of velocity or how quickly you're changing your velocity. So if my car were somehow, well, I'll say this. Um, sometimes people like to brag about how, their, how fast their car can get to 60. That is a measure of acceleration. It's weird units because people usually say, my car goes zero to 60 in five seconds. So what, the way you would write that down, you would say 60 miles per hour per second, or per five seconds. So 12 miles per hour per second. That's a weird, those, that would be weird units, but that would work. So a really fast car goes 12 miles per hour per second. That's its acceleration, how quickly it can change. So most cars can get from zero miles an hour, that's a measure of velocity, to 60 miles an hour, that's also a measure of velocity, but how quickly your car can go from at rest to 60 miles an hour, how quickly you can do that is a measure of its acceleration. So acceleration is how quickly you can change your velocity. So a slow car can go from zero to 60, but it might take 10 minutes. A fast car can also go zero to 60, 
but it might be able to do that. I think a Tesla can do it in like five seconds or something. So a Tesla can go 12 miles per hour per second. For us, we're usually going to describe acceleration in meters per second per second. That's how we're going to measure acceleration. So right now, I am going zero meters per second. I'm not changing my position. Right now, I'm going one meter per second. I just changed my velocity. I went from zero to one. And it took me, I don't know, maybe one second. So that means I accelerated one meter per second in a second. Or sometimes that's phrased, one meter per second per second is sometimes meters per second squared. So hopefully we've seen that before. So if I were to drive my car off a cliff, its vertical velocity would start accelerating. And it actually would accelerate. So say I was going zero miles an hour vertically when I went off the cliff. I was going zero miles an hour. My car would actually accelerate vertically at, I think it's around 71,000 miles per hour per hour. Meaning it's going vertically zero when I drive off the cliff. And if the hole was deep enough, I don't think you could find one on this planet, but if the hole was deep enough, I'd be going 71,000 miles an hour after one hour. So my units of acceleration, you can imagine, and these are our crazy units, but would be miles per hour per hour or miles per hour squared. That's not a typical for us. For us, we're going to use meters per second for velocity, then meters per second per second, or meters per second squared for acceleration. OK. So when we talk about Newton's second law, there's this A, and that's really important that we have a good grasp of what that means. And it, what that means is if I push on something, and this, so I've been saying this all along, but now I think I want us to have a really better understanding with the A part. When I push on something, what's it going to do? It's going to accelerate. It's going to change its velocity. And as I've said before, velocity is sort of your state that is almost inherent in you. You're either at rest or you're moving. That's kind of your state. So an object at rest wants to stay that way. An object in motion wants to stay that way. If you want to change that state, you want to speed it up, slow it down, bring it to a stop, get it going, any change in its state is an acceleration. And that requires a force. So that's the whole picture of, that, of Newton's second law, of, Newton's, of that equation. Most, if Newton's first thing and second together, maybe, could be phrased that way. That stuff at rest wants to stay that way, stuff in motion wants to stay that way. If you want to change that, it's not going to happen unless you add a push or a pull, a force. So that's kind of Newton's first and second together. Um, here's the game I was going to play to try to demonstrate this. This will, this might be, this might work. We'll see. Oh no. There it is. Okay. Um, so what I have up here is this is actually not a speedometer, but a velocity meter. This actually will tell me velocity of the thing in front of it. This is a little um, sensor. It's actually you'll hear it. It starts clicking. You may have used this like in high school. One of these in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Great question. I should summarize position, velocity, acceleration real quick before we move on. So position is where you're at. Velocity is how quickly or the rate that you're changing that. So velocity is the rate at which you're changing your position. And acceleration is the rate at which you're changing velocity. So that's a good summary. And that's a very good question. The, the relationship between those two. So I've got position. I've got how quickly I'm changing that and how quickly I'm changing that. How quickly am I changing my position? That's velocity. How quickly am I changing my velocity? That's my acceleration. And hopefully, uh, a graph might help. Um, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a graph of my of velocity. And I, so in this class, uh, we're going to, I guess, by the nature of the class, we're going to learn, learn a lot of things like this. Blah, me talking to you. Um, I'm hoping pictures will help sometimes. Uh, so here's, for, uh, we only have like seven minutes left, but here's some, there's a picture of velocity. So I've got a little sensor here. You're going to hear it clicking. It's actually shooting out little sound waves. And it's timing how quickly the sound waves come back 
and from that it can calculate how fast I'm going. And so let's see if it works. So right now my velocity is zero. It's pretty constant zero. So you can see it's just hanging out right at the zero. That's the zero axis. And if I start moving away from the thing, that's a positive velocity. So that first line is a half meter per second, and that second line is one meter per second. So if I walk one meter per second, I can kind of get it there. And now I'm stopped again. Let's see if I can get back in front of it. Can it pick me up? I think it doesn't like my tie or something. It's freaking out. How could you not like that tie? OK, let's see this. So now I'm over here. Anyway, now I'm back at 0. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the distance between me and the thing. In other words, my position is going to go down. And if my position goes, if my position goes down, I'm going to reduce the distance. If my position goes down, that will be a negative velocity. So I should be able to get a nice constant one meter per second toward it. Yeah, that's not bad. OK. So you can see that's a negative velocity. So I'm getting a nice constant negative velocity. Right now it's zero, obviously. There's nothing in front of it. But I could even stand in front of it. So here's a nice zero velocity. And then as I start moving away, I can get a nice positive one. And then I'm going to come to a stop. And I can get a nice negative one there. OK. So that's, those are plots. Oh, let's see. Let's try the, I wanted to try the skateboard. Let's see if that's going to work. So notice, if you try walking, it's almost impossible to walk, unless you were like in marching band or something. It's impossible to walk at a constant velocity because, you know, I'm a biped. I've got these like cyclical velocity types of stroll. Let's see uh, if, I can, if I can go at a constant velocity. No? OK. Now negative velocity. No. OK. There it is. OK. Um, but that's okay. That's only part of the picture. So velocity we get. Velocity, I, right, right now what I've been trying to demonstrate is a constant velocity. So that's a constant velocity. And if, I'm, if my velocity is constant, in other words, the line is stuck at zero or stuck at half, my acceleration is zero because I'm not changing my velocity. So what I want us to see. What I want us to see is not just what it looks like to have a constant velocity, but also an acceleration. So right now, my velocity is kind of hanging out at 0. And let's see if I can, s this is almost impossible to do, see if I can constantly accelerate. And so I'm, s I'm hanging out at 0, and I'm going to speed up, and then faster, and faster, and faster, and faster, and faster, and faster. And see how it's not, it's not a straight line. It's, it's not a horizontal line. It's kind of shooting up. That's my acceleration. And we're not going to get too much into the, the math in this class, but it's important that we remember a term from high school, slope. Remember that from geometry or something? I don't remember. Slope, that's important to know, because if I'm going to use pictures like this one to demonstrate velocity and acceleration, I want us to see what's going on in those pictures. So what's going on in those pictures, it's plotting velocity, but it's also showing you my acceleration. You might remember from another class, that slope is rate of change. That right ring a bell somewhere. Slope is rate of change. So slope is the rate at which I'm changing my velocity. So my acceleration is on that plot. So that's a plot of velocity, but it's also a plot of my acceleration. And that acceleration shows up by the slope. So right now, the slope is 0. That's flat. So that's a 0 slope. And if I were to speed up, you can see my acceleration by the slope of that speed up. And then let's see. I could have a negative slope. That's harder to do. OK. So that's I want us to see that. Where, um, and because I'm going to be drawing, the next couple days we talk about position velocity acceleration, I'm going to be drawing pictures of velocity. And I want us to be able to see that. So I think a velocity plot as we're talking about mo moving things, we're talking about the laws of motion, a velocity plot is, plot is often a good tool for that. And I want us to be able to see in the plot, obviously the, the value of the plot is the velocity, but the slope is how much you're accelerating. And what I, let's see. I, what I haven't tried yet, what I haven't tried, this may work. All right, we might try this. Okay, what I 
might try, if I can throw this vertically, which is super unlikely, is to see this thing. I'm going to accelerate it by throwing it up. And then it's going to, let's see, what, let's see if it works. Nope. Am I throwing it clo in close to vertically? Yeah, OK. Actually, there it is right there. Um, OK. You can kind of see it. We'll have to talk more about it. I'll come up with a better way to demonstrate it. You can kind of see, let's see if you can see my mouse. Here, here's me holding the basketball stationary. Here's me throwing the basketball up. So I, gave it an, I just gave it a quick acceleration. Then it left my fingers. And here's the basketball on its way down. And I think this is the last thing I'll mention. So one other thing after this before we pack up. Here's the, the basketball on its way down. Its velocity is decreasing. Or actually, it's not on its way down. Sorry. Here's the basketball slowing down. So I, it left my hands. I gave it a very, I, I accelerated it up to some velocity. I don't know, three or something up here. So it got, I gave it three, and then it left, after, as soon as it left my hands, it started slowing down. So the velocity was decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. And what this spot right here, the tendency is to think, oh, that's when it got back to my hand or something. That's actually when, well, what's the velocity right there? The velocity there is zero. That's when it slowed to a stop and started accelerating in the opposite direction back toward me, which this thing was treating as negative. Let's see. Yeah. So that thing was treating as negative the downward velocity, the velocity back toward it. So what you're seeing in that very steep but not vertical line is the ball slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, coming to a stop, and speeding up, speeding up, speeding up in the opposite direction. OK, looks like uh, people are starting to want to pack up. Uh, please remember, homework is due by 1 p.m. on Friday. See you Friday.